Access is Internet and Public Libraries, and it's a, it's a pleasure to be here with you tonight to uh, launch the Slave Exhibition in the Reed Room and to introduce our featured speaker. Um, before I do that, I'll have to um, do some thank yous, as you'll know if you've attended these before. First, go to Anthony Tedeschi and Dallas Sunley from the Heritage Collections, who have jointly curated uh, this exhibition. So, Anthony and Dallas, thank you. Uh, next to the Bindery team from the library, Kathleen McCarthy and her team have done the exhibit supports and the exhibition installation. Uh, Casey Thomas, uh, an evening City Council graphic design unit, or marketing unit really, but Casey's a graphic designer and she's done the, uh, the graphic design work for the exhibition. And we also have to thank our loan institutions, the City Council Archives, Dunedin Club, Port Charles Regional Maritime Museum and Port Otago Limited, thanks to all of those institutions. Now, Anthony has told me that curating three to four exhibitions per year on any topic relevant to the heritage collections could be a daunting task were it not for the authors and scholars who have written on the subject to hand. Special thanks must go to me in church. There is, Ian. <laughs> book last, Port to Antarctica, Dunedin and Port Charles, 100 years of polar service provided a valuable resource in putting together and writing about this exhibition. In fact, not only will you notice a number of captions of Site Ian's book, the curators tell me they've been guided throughout the whole process by his work. Really, really good to have your work available for that. Now, without further ado, with no breaks, I'm going to introduce you to uh, Neville Peake. Really, uh, the cliche is, is it the man who needs no introduction? <laughs> In your case, it's probably true, Neville. Uh, Neville Peake is a Dunedin writer and photographer who has lived beside the sea for most of his life. He crossed the Tasman on his first overseas venture in 1969 aboard a P&O liner. Based now on the peninsula, he wrote shipping news for the Argus newspaper in Cape Town and Dunedin's Evening Star in the 1970s. His many books explore themes of geography, from Antarctica to, to tropical Tokelau, natural science and biography. Since 1990, he has worked as a study leader and a lecturer aboard exhibition ships visiting New Zealand waters, including the sub-Antarctic region. An Otago Regional Councillor for nine years, uh, Pete has long been involved in environmental politics. In 2007, Neville was awarded New Zealand's largest literary prize, the Creative New Zealand Michael King Writers Fellowship. Your latest book, due to be released before November, is Shackleton's Whiskey, which explores the subject of Sir Ernest Shackleton's 1907-9 Antarctic Exhibition and features the story of the whisky taken to Cape Lloyd's McMurdo Sound and rediscovered and replicated a hundred years later. So the question on all our lips will <laughs> be, <laughs> did you get to try the original whisky or, yeah. or the replica? Oh, just the replica. <laughs> and how was it? Well, I got pretty close to the original. So. Yeah? Mm. And how was it? Beautiful. Okay. A ladies' whisky, that would have said. <laughs> okay, so a warm welcome. There will be. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Mike. I thought, I'm pretty sure I heard you say exhibition ship that I work on. But anyway, you might have said expedition. Yeah, you might have said that. I think this is an expedition, exhibition ship, this place. And how lucky we are to have the Dunedin Public Library. It's just wonderful to have this. Uh, these exhibitions rolling through here. The libraries are liberators of knowledge, of uh, inspiration, of enlightenment, don't they? And, uh, you know, we're here to, to celebrate a, a quite a, uh, a, a wonderful collection of, of material that links Dunedin uh, to the Antarctic. There are one or two fellow Antarcticans here uh, this evening. Uh, so, to friends of the library and, and to, um, to everyone, ladies and gentlemen, uh, uh, warm welcome. Um, I was going to uh, make a few acknowledgements first because I'm bound to f forget them at the end. Um, but just let me add to uh, what Mike's uh, um, said about uh, the work of, of Anthony and Adelph here uh, putting this together. Anthony was saying beforehand that since 2006 when these rooms I think were set up there have been uh, 23 exhibitions. Now that's incredible isn't it? So uh, I'm, I'm uh, honoured to be asked to, to uh, say a few words here. Uh, I also wanted to acknowledge Ian, um, in case you haven't seen it, this is his book. It's not a thick tome, but man, has it got a concentrated some information in here, and not only gone through the expedition, some of it, which I'll refer to in, in the next 15, 20 minutes, but he's added some new material 
uh, stuff that hadn't been seen before from, from his research. So Ian, congratulations on that. Uh, and I guess I'm the reason I'm here, maybe standing here, not you, is that I have a book coming out shortly. <laughs> so that might be a bit of a, a hook for, for me. Um, so that's last brought to Antarctica. It really opened my eyes when I looked at it. Although I knew, I'd known because I've been in, you know, visiting Antarctica since the 70s, uh, that there were good, strong connections here with Dunedin, but not to the extent that, uh, that Ian has, has uh, documented here. You know that uh, we do have memorials and things that remind us of Antarctica here. We've got, uh, the, obviously, the Scott Memorial at Port Chalmers, and Scott is the big focus, and, and probably the trigger for this, this exhibition. Um, and that memorial went in not too long, I think 1913, is that right? Yeah, 1913, big stone memorial using that lovely Port Chalmers stone. Uh, and we have a bird memorial here too, at Unity Park. If you haven't seen it, come and have a look, say hello. And, um, do a hongi with them just about, because it's a bust, uh, and the only other equivalent bust of that is a fuller uh, uh, expression of, this, of the whole body uh, uh, statue in, in Washington, D.C., uh, which I've also seen because I was there a few years ago. Uh, but the other bust is at McMurdo Sound, at McMurdo Station. And here we are privileged to, to have him here, and I'll, I'll come, come back to that. Then there are the street names. We've got Falcon, after Robert Falcon Scott, and we've got Oates, of course, and both of those are uh, in high road called Rosin. I think they, most people would agree with that, looking down into the Kaipurai Valley. And the, the, uh, the, the DCC uh, had, had the presence of mind to, uh, to commemorate um, the, uh, the sacrifice of those, those two guys. You know, there are more than 60 items here. Um, and have come from various places and might be acknowledged uh, apart from the collections uh, and the wonderful collection here at the library that there are a number of, and uh, the Maritime Museum at Port Chalmers was one uh, where the typewriter came out of that and Scott's, uh, maybe Scott's, I think uh, the, the, the caption talks about that um, and uh, Port Otago, DCC and the Dunedin Club has got even some material, I was there for the Queen uh, Mary Mater Maternity Centre 75th, admiring, I uh, see we've got the manager here tonight, uh, admiring the, uh, 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 all, all of the, the works of art and, and the memorability that they have down there too. So you're going to see, you know, apart from typewriter, you'll see other things, letters, books and, and so on. And speaking of books, there was one down the end there uh, that uh, expresses uh, the very first, I think, connection, real tangible connection with Antarctica from Dunedin. It was, it's the book of the, a ship, Antarctica, a whaler, that went down uh, to the Ross Sea region and from it, men stepped ashore for the first time on the continent of, Antarctica, of, of Antarctica. So they left from Dunedin. It's quite a thing to say that, isn't it? And not only that, but, you know, four or five years later, uh, Borkovink's expedition, and he was on that first ship too, Antarctica, uh, went down there and they had the first winter in Antarctica, leaving from uh, the port of Otago. I have to say, in terms of the, the Henrik Ball expedition, which was that, uh, that book talks about, uh, I have been, have been and had a few books on Stewart Island, uh, and, and I'm always reminded that Alexander von Tunzelman and three other Stewart Islanders joined the ship and went down there. And at Cape Adair, uh, uh, Alexander, to his dying day, said that he was the first one to step on the continent, mm -hmm. and not Borgovink or Paul or anybody else, because he leapt off and steadied the, the ship's long boat, and, and he was in the water. Was he on the dark <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. But anyway, that was his story. So, you know, Stuart Island. Um, there is a lot of uh, Scott memorabilia in here too, and I hope you get a chance to, to look through it, and even read, you know, some of the, um, the, the stories. And, and I, know, I know because I've uh, in recent years, uh, having done a, a book about the New Zealand-US cooperation in Antarctica, I had uh, a look at uh, right through the collection here, 
uh, at what was held here in terms of, um, of the, the, those heroic era uh, expeditions. So two Scott expeditions came through here. The big farewells were out of Lytton, weren't they? We, know, we all know that. But they came here. This was the leaping off place uh, for Antarctica, for both the Discovery Expedition and in 1901 uh, and in 1910 the uh, Terra Nova Expedition. And uh, a Scott very um, happily for me decided to leave on the 29th of November and that happens to be my birthday. And uh, every time I see that come up in the history of, of, uh, uh, of Antarctica and will we'll come up again in the story, uh, I'm, I'm always reminded of, of what happened on that day way back when. And uh, so there were the two Scott expeditions uh, going out of here and um, of course uh, the, the reason we're gathered I guess is uh, that this year is the uh, 100 uh, or the centenary of, of uh, the death of uh, Captain Scott and, uh, uh, and four of his South Pole uh, conquerors. As you know they did not make it, uh, well they did make it, but they did not make it back. And uh, I just wanted to just lift a couple of uh, lines from here, uh, from his, uh, uh, from the book, a diary, uh, Scott's last expedition to William Zara, and um, just to ex just to express to you just kind of how composed he was at the very end in that tent, hunkered down, four days in a blizzard, eleven miles from too too too, too far from the final depot one tonne depot it was. Uh, had they made it, they might have got back, but the weather was closing in. This is marched far too late to be out on the Ross Ice Shelf. Far too late uh, to have spent so long, uh, you know, out there getting to the pole and back. And uh, so you have to imagine the three of them in the tent by this time because both Evans and Oates have, have uh, died and they've left them behind rather sadly, but uh, there are Bowers and, and uh, Edward Wilson, Booty Bowers, and by the way there's quite a bit going on at Greenock. I passed through there just in May this year. Uh, Greenock is hometown in New Glasgow. And um, uh, quite, a, uh, quite a bit to honour him as well because he was really you know, great, the hard man of that, uh, that expedition. But Scott sat in that tent with no hope left and wrote about a dozen letters and the letters are all here in this, in this book. And then, finally, message to the public. And it is something, you know, that uh, it, it probably is the reason why uh, he is such a big name, why we call our Antarctic station Scott Base, uh, and why he has always featured in, in, the, in, the, history, in the history teaching, uh, in, at least for me anyway, at high school. Uh, so, just a couple of lines uh, from here. He's saying we arrived within 11, hour, 11 miles of our old one ton camp with fuel for one last meal and food for two days. For, for four days we have been unable to leave the tent, the gale howling about us. We are weak, writing is difficult, but for my own sake I do not regret this journey which has shown that Englishmen can endure hardships, help one another and meet death with as great a fortitude as ever in the past. We took risks, we knew we took them. Things have come out against us and therefore we have no cause for complaint but bow to the will of Providence, determined still to do our best to the last. Had we lived, I should have had a tale to tell of the hardihood, endurance and courage of my companions, which would have stirred the heart of every Englishman. These rough notes and our dead bodies must tell the tale. But surely, surely a great country such as ours will see that those who are dependent on us are properly provided for. This, these are the last words of a man who was uh, obviously, you know, um, thought there was no future, but still able to put together some incredible stuff. Those were three words, these rough notes, appear on the Scott Polar Research Institute outside in May they were anyway, I think the exhibition was just about to end, but that was an exhibition uh, that had a lot of memorabilia uh, about uh, T. 
hear about the Terra Nova expedition. Uh, an exhibition, incidentally, I saw also in, um, in Sydney at the Maritime Museum there uh, earlier um, or late last year. And about 80% of the stuff comes from Canterbury Museum. We in New Zealand hold a tremendous amount of Scott memorabilia. In 1908, uh, in between the two Scott um, expeditions was, uh, was Shackleton leading his first expedition. He'd been on that with the first discovery one and he was leading his uh, Nimrod expedition. Nimrod didn't come in here, but there is a connection and ends, you know, used the, that connection in his book too. Uh, and I've revisited it because uh, it's important in terms of, um, of, of what I'm writing about in Shackleton's whiskey. But the connection is with the Union Steamship Company, which uh, provided a freighter called Cunha to tow the Nimrod from Littleton uh, to the, uh, the pack ice, about two-thirds of the journey. Because uh, for Nimrod to use coal to get there, she would have run out by the time she'd been all the way down uh, to the Ross Sea region of, of Antarctica and tried to get back. And the Union Company put out half the price and the government, New Zealand government, put out the other half. Uh, and Cunha did a tremendous job uh, of towing Nimrod all the down through the tremendous seas. And I've tried to portray just how difficult it was um, for the people on the, the crew and the, uh, the expedition team on the Nimrod. So there's that connection, and it went, it just goes a little bit further, because I borrowed Shackleton's a book of that expedition, The Heart of the Antarctic, and in it, I blame it, yeah, the guy didn't know the guy I borrowed it from, but in it was with the, with the signature James Mills. So James Mills was the head of the Union Steamship Company at that time. So we're just moving on now from the heroic era, uh, well, towards the end of it anyway, to Bird. American uh, Commander Byrd was here twice, two expeditions, one in 1928, uh, with the city of New York and Alan of Bowling. Um, he, he was uh, offered a fr free use of the wharves here and freedom of the city, the Tiger Harbour Ward welcomed him, uh, in fact, rode across to him, uh, saying, come and spend, you know, base yourself here. So he was definitely based here. Uh, the citizens of Dunedin turned out in huge numbers. They seemed particularly interested in the huskies that were taken on to Quarantine Island in the harbour and, uh, and given an exercise and they did some training pulling things even though there was no snow around. <laughs> and, um, uh, and ferries, you know, those were the days the harbour ferries would take great crowds of people down to Quarantine Island to see these huskies performing down here before um, Bird left. He, on that trip down to Antarctica, that visit, that expedition, he flew over the South Pole for the first time anyone had flown over the South Pole. And he, he there's some there's a famous line about, so there's nothing really there to see. You get there and then you come back. <laughs> That's it. Um, he, and so he's quite disparaging about the your landscape down there. But he did that on the 29th of November, 1939. <laughs> he was back again with the Bear of Oakland. Uh, and 34, and they departed in January 35, again from Dunedin for the Bay of Wales. Then there was the American aviator uh, Lincoln Ellsworth as well in, in 1933 with the Wyatt Earp. Uh, and so you sort of go on now to Operation Deep Freeze. I bet there's a lot of people here remember that. We're talking about the late 50s, a period of about 10 years when the, the United States Navy based what they called picket ships here. There were various kinds of frigates and things. Um, and um, I remember them because I was a reporter on the Evening Star uh, in the late 60s and I remember especially Calcutta, Mills and Vance uh, and some of you who were there on those in the late 50s would remember our USS Brough, Ruff and USS Mill, uh, USS uh, Peterson and they would go down to uh, 60 degrees south, 700 kilometres south of Campbell Island and get bashed around by those big southern ocean waves. And I still can see them, and you'll remember this too, you guys who are in the shipping business, uh, them coming back with their superstructure being, you know, this is steel superstructure, all bashed in uh, from the force of the waves. It was a time too when, um, uh, you know, Dunedin welcomed them uh, with open arms, some to the point where some Dunedin girls married the sailors, and there were quite a number of, of that. Of those 
this letter just happened. I should have said too, to put a context for all that heroic era stuff. Well, that Dunedin was bigger on the, on the New Zealand landscape than it is now. It was a commercial powerhouse, uh, the biggest one, uh, certainly in the late 1800s and early 1900s that we had. We had lots of head offices here, uh, and there was a lot of commercial vigour around. Dunedin by the 60s was starting to lose head offices and some of its commercial status, but nonetheless it was a great base for the Operation Big Fred ships. And so moving on now just to current days and I'll, I'll wind up here. Um, we have connections go that are ongoing uh, and the University of Otago is the first thing that you think of. But in the earth sciences and in the life sciences uh, there are numbers of people who go to Antarctica, join in with the New Zealand Antarctic Research Program, uh, and they think of uh, Gary Gary Wilson, who's got a, a leading job now. I think uh, you and in the uh, is it a research institute? Is that it? based here? Isn't it? Uh, no, anyway. Yeah. And you and yourself, you've been yeah, of course, that's you and Ford, I said, and as paleontologist. Uh, and um, so we have that wonderful link uh, going on with the University of Otago, uh, and. If you, weren't, if you weren't aware of it, um, there is a, a very physical link sitting down there in the steamer basin right now. Have a look if you live over in Anderson's Bay on the way home. It's called Lustre Lab. It is a French icebreaker and research uh, sh uh, vessel that I normally see when I go to Hobart with my expeditions in the Southern Antarctica. She's here for some servicing and, and, um, and, and maybe some repairs and a survey uh, and has been here for a couple of weeks and, and uh, will be sailing shortly. And so a big red hull and she goes, she'd been operating out of Hobart for 15 years, taking Australians uh, down to their, their bases out of French expeditions to do mock to build. And so just to finish off, um, uh, yeah, as Mike says, I'm connected to, uh, these days to uh, right now to the Antarctic through the Shackle and Whiskey book coming out um, uh, early next month. Um, and uh, I've enjoyed re retracing that, that whole story. It's, there are parallel stories going on here of the whiskey, the manufacture of it, and then the ordering of it by Shackleton. A teetotaler, by the way, although he would have a little bit of uh, orange curacao or, um, or champagne occasionally, but he never tolerated more than a mild spree on his expeditions, as he called it. And um, uh, so he ordered 300 bottles. And they went down to uh, Cape Royds and 25 cases of that three were found underneath in 2006-07 underneath the hut, the hut all frozen up and bedded in ice. One case came to Canterbury Museum, thawed and three bottles went to Scotland for sampling. They are still there and uh, I saw them in May this year up in Invergordon near Inverness where the whisky was made for Shepparton. Um, so that you'll see that story unfold shortly. But just a um, just the last thing about Robert McNabb. Um, the Reed collections here. McNabb contributed his uh, I think 1913. That'd be the same year as the memorial went up at uh, Port Chalmers. Thanks, Anthony. And um, yeah, I pay tribute to Robert McNabb, and, and so does this expedition exhibition because there is a photograph of him meeting Shackleton in 1916 when the Aurora was here and was going down uh, to Antarctica to uh, relieve the Ross Sea Party, so you all know that, uh, that was supporting his uh, Trans-Antarctic uh, ex expedition in uh, 1914 17 So thank you very much uh, for your invitation, uh, Mike, and, 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 um, and Anthony and Delph, an invitation to say a few words about this. Um, I don't know, do you, do you take questions of those? Just, oh, I think you, just, just, you just open it and that's, okay. uh, that's about that. <laughs> well, yeah, um, I, I, I feel that uh, you're all participating in this opening, but let, let us uh, open it with a great round of applause. Thank you very much. <laughs>